Welcome to the SIBO Doctor Podcast with Dr. Narala Jacoby. If you're a practitioner and want to learn the basics of SIBO, head over to SIBOtest.com and sign up as a practitioner. This will give you access to a free 90-minute webinar on the fundamentals of SIBO treatment. If you're a patient, please know this information is not intended to diagnose or treat a medical condition. Please ask your doctor before initiating any new treatments. And now, over to Dr. Jacoby and the SIBO Doctor Podcast. If you're like me, you're finding that treating small intestinal bacterial overgrowth can be complicated. Patients often present with a myriad of symptoms and associated conditions which require holistic thinking and a methodical approach to treatment. This podcast was born out of a desire to start a conversation with other practitioners, educators, experts, and researchers, and see if their insights can give us new treatment considerations, especially for our difficult cases. In this podcast series, our guests talk about functional gut disorders, hormonal issues, the enteric nervous system, food intolerances, the immune system, the microbiome, methylation and genomic issues, and everything else that can make a SIBO case very confusing. I believe that by understanding the often complex interconnection of SIBO with other disease manifestations, we can be more effective in our treatment approaches. I hope you find this podcast useful in your practice, and thank you for listening. Hello, SIBO practitioners. Today, I'm in conversation with Dr. Margaret Beeson, and we'll be talking about candida and small intestine fungal overgrowth. Dr. Beeson has an impressive career in the field of medicine spanning over 40 years. She started as a nurse in the Navy and moved on to become a naturopathic physician and founded the Yellowstone Naturopathic Clinic in Billings, Montana, where I met her in 1998 when I started out as a resident there. She's also the president and co-founder of the Naturopathic Education and Research Consortium. It's a nonprofit dedicated to increasing postgraduate training, residency and clinical practice opportunities for NDs in the US, and also the president of the Paul Gardner Veterans Pain Relief Foundation, a nonprofit to uh, bring options to veterans to address chronic pain. She's also the very well-deserved recipient of, this, of the prestigious 2016 Physician of the Year Award from the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians. Dr. Beeson is a national leader in efforts to advance the quality of naturopathic care and integrative conventional and alternative medicine and a very, very dear friend of mine. So, um, so happy and um, pleased to welcome Dr. Beeson to the program. And there are so many topics I want to talk with you about, Maggie, because you uh, have such a wealth of experience with naturopathic care in so many different arenas. But I remember clearly when I first started out as a resident in 1998, we, we did candida so much in, um, in Billings, Montana. I'm not sure if things have changed, but um, one of the issues, of course, why I wanted to talk to you about that, because I think you, you really understand that topic very well. And now that we have a new word for candida, or which is CIFO, <clears throat> probably also LIFO, which is large intestinal fungal <laughs> overgrowth, um, and there is actually not a whole lot of research looking at CIFO and what, what's going on there. And we need more research into it. But there is a, a study from 2013 by Jacobs um, that showed in 150 subjects that had this quote-unquote unexplained uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, which, of course, as naturopathic practitioners, we see that all the time in our, in our clinics. Very vague, um, this particular uh, description in this study, but 94 of the 150, or 63 percent, had um, SIBO. Um, had, sorry, 63 percent had overgrowth, um, 40 percent had SIBO, 26 percent had CIFO alone, 
right? Mm -hmm. And um, about 30, uh, 34% had a mixed SIBO CFO picture. So it's a very common comorbid um, situation with SIBO. So just want to kind of um, also point out that sometimes it's just CFO, right? It's not necessarily SIBO, but so, you know, what do you, do you often consider CFO in your SIBO patients or how are you, how are you addressing the problem? I guess I would have to say that I probably always consider SIBO first now, uh, to, to people that are experts in SIBO, that might seem like, um, a, uh, what's the word? <laughs> sacrilege. Yes, that was the word. Thank you. That's, that's sacrilege, right? Yes. But I, I, I just am amazed. And I, I want to say that when I, um, was a nurse in, um, I actually worked in Dr. Markwood's office in California. He was a general practice physician who uh, became a clinical ecologist in the late 70s and early 80s. And we first started on, on uh, Dr. Orion Trust was the uh, mm. physician who wrote, the, you know, the missing diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And we first uh, were treating uh, Candida with Nystatin. And then I went to Naturopathic Medical School, Bastyr, and we started, you know, candida was all the rage, and we were using the um, endosolic acid and the caprylic acid. And when I started practicing, I'm like, oh, right, candida, I want to hear nothing about it. You know, I'm, I just think it's, you know, not really that valid. And then as I started practicing and see the uh, modern day, you know, combination of high sugar use, soda pop, you know, more sugar than in the last, you know, 50 years we've consumed in the prior probably 500, um, you know, a along with antibiotic use, mm. again, in the last 50 years, it's the perfect uh, environment, it, perfect environment. And so practicing seeing that, and then as you know, and I can, you know, I want to read a very short paragraph out of the textbook Medical Mycology, which I think you were aware of, mm -hmm. that basically says why, why this is a huge, huge factor. And so I, I start there and I start there. And then if, you know, if we really don't get the results we need, or it's obviously SIBO, then we go to that. But I, I think the SIFO is, is an underlying. And one other thing I want to say is it, I d just recently um, did quite a bit of research looking at um, a lot of the, you know, endotoxin association with that and more things we're going to talk about. And I, Actually, I'm surprised how much there is out there when you really start to dig about mm -hmm. candy. Mm -hmm. But there is quite a bit more. And that the fact that it is one person called it the master con artist, mm -hmm. the fact that it's able to defend itself um, so incredibly and, and metamorphosize itself so that it can hide. Uh, you know, so I think that it's such. And, and the other thing about it is that I think it's a symptom of dysbiosis because it is the major opportunistic organism. That and then something I found out recently that makes me really interested in that is that it apparently those fungal um, uh, white fungal uh, colon colonies are not just Candida albicans. They actually are combinations of bacteria that are um, specific for the site. So in other words, the major bacteria that inhabit the mouth or the ones that inhabit the esophagus, uh, or the ones that inhabit the small intestine, or the ones that have the large intestine, there may be in a, a candida colony, actually, you know, two or three or four of these bacteria are actually even being protected in those colonies. And so, mm. that, that you actually, yeah, I thought mm -hmm. that was such interesting information, mm -hmm. really. You mean like in biofilm, they they often yeah. coexist in biofilm? Mm -hmm. yeah. So the white plaques are actually a type of biofilm that include different bacteria depending mm. on the site of colonization and mm. the die off we'll talk about that but yeah so very mm. interesting very very interesting so did you want to read that paragraph out of the textbook of mycology uh yeah let me do that so i was um because i remember you you know we had this conversation 20 years ago and you you t already told me back then and also uh, william uh, crook and the yeast connection i mean that was like and we got great results. It's not that we didn't get results. It's just, an, you know, it just sort of dovetails also into why I became interested in SIBO, because then there are people that 
um, do not improve with just candida treatment because we're still eating, you know, we're still feeding bacteria on some level or they have this bacterial overgrowth that, as we now know, has lots of underlying causes. So it's it's just, yeah. uh, you know, so for me, that was really the the impetus to also look or, or it just resonated with me when I heard Dr. Seebecker those many years ago talk about SIBO. I was like, oh, my God, that's the people that didn't improve with what we were doing. You know? Yeah, exactly. Totally. Mm. And yeah, by treating that basic underlying and then you don't get the results and then you can go that the next mm -hmm. step. Mm -hmm. So, yes, so the um, medical mycology is a textbook. This is an older, old edition now. But um, the, the, the thickest chapter in there, chapter 20, is called Candidiasis and the Pathogenic Yeast. And it says... Um, yeast associated with human disease. In the strictest sense of the word, there are no inherently pathogenic yeast. Those that are associated with human or animal disease are incapable of producing infection in the normal, healthy individual. Some alteration of the host of cellular defenses, physiology, or normal flora must occur before colonization, infection, and disease production by yeast can take place. The pathogenic potential of yeast varies considerably with the most virulent organism being Candida albicans. Slight changes, any of those three factors just mentioned, so that is the whole cellular defense, the physiology, or the normal flora, right, must, may allow this normal human commensal to infect, as noted previously, the severity of disease will depend on the seriousness of the host alteration rather than any pathogenic potential um, exhibited by the fungus. But this is the last sentence, and I think it's really important, because of its rapid ability to colonize and take advantage of many types of host alterations, the clinical manifestations of candida infections are protein. The mm. disease may be cutaneous, mucutaneous, subcutaneous, or systemic, or maybe involve all of those areas. And candida albicans account for the vast majority of disease caused by yeast. Mm. And it goes on, you know. Mm. So that to me is just salient, right, to really grasp that. Mm. It's really, it's almost a description of antibiotics, right? Change in physiology, a change in normal flora, and a change in immune, immune response mm. right there. Mm. So, um, and, and also the description of the terrain, the terrain has to be, you know, sufficiently disturbed for candida to really take hold. Um, and we know that there are different species besides albicans, but for the, for the, for the purpose of the discussion, we'll, we'll probably just call it generally candida. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I've also talked to Alison about when she was here in Australia, um, she, you know, we, we had this kind of conversation about die-off and or the Herxheimer reaction, as many of you mm -hmm. will know. And um, we both agreed that die-off is actually a lot stronger when uh, with fungus or with candida than it is with bacteria. Do you right. observe the same in your clinic? Yes, I, I believe that's the case, and I, I was mm. um, I was thinking when I was reading the articles about the uh, kind of cohabitation uh, of the bacteria and the candida that may be part of the reason, you know, that you are mm. having two things dying off. But the other thing um, may actually have to do with the hyphae invasion of the intestinal mucosa, right? And so when you have that invasion, you, you're going to have a, quite a bit more intestinal permeability. And then all of the metabolites, apparently like 70 different metabolites, that was from Dr. Truss, that the, the fungal organisms are producing that, um, you know, begin to, uh, that the liver has to, to process because of that, that mm. um, you know, intestinal permeability. So, you know, because, because as the, the yeast matures, it actually has those little pod feet that embed itself down into the, um, wall of the of the intestinal tract, mm. you know. So perhaps as you're killing them, there's a lot more opportunity for the body to pick up that. Or, you know, I, I don't I don't know all the other reasons. I was sort of searching mm. for. I mean, it, there there are some other things about you know. Um, I was looking at that Jarish Hoopsauer reaction. They were talking about this pro-inflammatory cytokine. Um, the certain ones like the tumor necrosis factor and IL six and IL eight. Um, mm. are, are consistent with measurements of the patient's blood inhibition and that there was also some other um, information about um, the uh, that the a protective substance of glucan 
protective substance on candida um, actually initiates uh, NF uh, kappa beta. beta. Okay. Yeah. So oh, that would make yeah, sense so, then. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Mm. So. And then there's also what is it? Tartaric acid and and some of these other substances that are more endotoxins. Um, right. that can be, uh, you know, I mean, one of the big hallmarks of candida really is, I think, um, is really this brain fog, right? That mm -hmm. to me mm -hmm. is like, I think that that's more consistent with candida than I think with SIBO, although I certainly have a lot of patients that, um, that have that as a, as a primary symptom, well, I mean, not a primary symptom, but a very strong symptom. And, and it's multifactorial, but I do think brain fog is a big deal with candida. Um, so, but getting back to the high fee, so so candida actually has like, isn't it like two morphological stages or something, or that uh, when it's budding um, and when it has the high fee that are coming out. And the high fee are the little pods, pod-like feet that you're talking about, and yeah. causing the yeah. micro perforation and therefore potentially contributing to leaky gut which is so interesting because it is a normal flora, right? I mean, it's a normal organism that lives in the in the intestinal tract and only when it kind of overgrows does it become a problem. Much like with, with uh, SIBO bacteria, these are not pathogens per se. These are just component of our normal flora that have found themselves in the wrong location and are thriving there. So um, it's an interesting thing how a normal flora can actually contribute to illness in a way well and it might be even it might even be more than a normal flora in a way because when you think about that it, it um i mean it, it may be it may be the fact that there's a normal flora but that there are other aspects to candida that cause it to cause the issues other than just overgrowth that it may be actually um i was reading this one article about the fact that there's um their body has actually antibody uh, to candida and um, that it actually protects the body but that um, the body can actually uh, trick it can tr it can trick the body into creating these useless antibodies that sort of override and prevent the real actual antibodies from being effective oh um, wow yeah and then these other protective substances that it you will... You mean like the candida will it. protect itself with secreting certain substances? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why this, they termed it the, the, the master con arts. Right. You know, it has this, this capability of um, finding uh, ways to prevent um, it, the immune system from seeing it. And so I think that, you know, that's why some people could have really... Uh, apparent again it probably probably depends on where it is because you know people can have like uh, mouth candida or vaginal candida and not really have any apparent systemic effects from it and other people mm. can have significant systemic effects so it mm. may have something to do with not just concentration but where in the body and how much it's able to the body is able to protect it from uh, prevent it from turning into that high fi form whether you get intestinal permeability from it or whether you don't and then well, there's, I think, the four main um, forms, the glabra and the uh, mm. para, you know, uh, the other ones, there's three other ones besides the, the albicans. Mm. Um, the albicans is considered to be the one that's actually the most uh, detrimental and the most invasive. Mm. And I remember back when um, I was working at the Yellowstone Naturopathic Clinic, um, and we would do stool tests. I mean, you know, we do stool tests now. All, I do them all the time. But very often we wouldn't find it. And even now I don't like often don't um, really, you know, sometimes you can't identify candida on a stool test. It just says um, it's not cultured out. Or even back when I was able to do pap smears um, in Billings, and we would, we would, it was clearly candida. You could have a, a woman um, do a pap smear on a woman. It's clearly thrush, uh, vaginal candida, candidiasis, and you swab it. And not always would it culture out as candida, you know? So, yeah, so sure. that was a real eye opener for me how this organism can evade detection even when it's like staring you right in the eye, 
So yeah, right, exactly. So I often so that, do go by symptoms. You know, I go I go by symptoms, and I go by when I look on a stool test. And I'd like to get your feedback on that or your input on that. When I see a stool test, um, and it says. Um, like it cultures out Candida um, glabrata or um, Geotrichum, or which is a different species, I know, but um, and also uh, just in very low levels, but it puts it under normal commensals. I still and I see that the, it ha under microscopic exam they have few or moderate amounts of yeast, and that's obvious to me, you know. But yeah, I think a lot yeah. of practitioners don't really or are not aware that candida might be present um, and can be sort of hidden in little markers on a stool test. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why, I don't know if you recall, um, when I used to uh, have the opportunity to speak with Dr. Truss on the telephone, I used to be able to call him. He was in uh, Birmingham. He, he sent me a paper that he um, had, uh, it was a, a study that he did, um, generalized symptoms in women with chronic uh, yeast vaginitis, treatment with nystatin, etc. They published this in the journal Advancement of Medicine way back in 1992, and uh, it was quite. A, it was done independently, and one of the pages in there he has the comparison of general symptoms of superficial candidiasis with uh, symptoms of chronic fatigue, and so the main symptoms, right, memory loss and fatigue and, and that. But but there is he, what he says in there: limitations of laboratory diagnosis of chronic yeast infection, right? And he says even in its most severe and often fatal form. A deep systemic yeast uh, diagnosis is largely clinical. And he talks about how antibody le uh, levels frequently fail to re re reflect widespread autopsy, proven dissemination of yeast into mm. internal organs. Goes on about these, you know, people both had, you know, um, negative blood cultures and numerous attempts, but then when they died, found that, that candida was in every organ of their body. And he says, that being true for the most advanced form of candidiasis, we seem unlikely that laboratory diagnosis would prove any more specific or helpful in the diagnosis of official form of candidiasis or the syndrome. And he talks about the unreliability of cultures, and the diagnosis was in fact demonstrated in this study that they had done independently, where they used two different techniques. And in, in only in seven of 40 of the patients were showed positive cultures before treatment. And their, their criteria was that the, the patient, there would be a history of chronic yeast vaginitis, either continuous at frequent intervals, and, and that they would have temporary improvement by anti-yeast treatment. Um, and they said, and they went on to, you know, include these women in the study, and that, you know, 36 of the 40 women improved not only their superficial yeast, you know, vaginal yeast symptoms, but all of those other, you know, symptoms, and that they all elected to think the study was originally supposed to be 40 weeks, and they all entered, you know, elected to carry on with the treatment just because it was such a substantial infect effect on them. You know. So he talks mm. about that really looking at having it be a clinical diagnosis, that you're looking at the history and you're looking at the symptoms, you're looking at all of that mm. in order to make your decisions about you treat. Mm. And then you treat like a lot of people, treat empirically. You treat mm. diseases empirically, right? You say, are you getting a response? And you know yourself, and I see it over and over and over again. I'm still totally amazed by it, mm. about how how people respond on such levels with so many you know crazy you know symptoms that you're like really that went away that went away because it's it's so core it's the mm. root of the tree. The, well, what you know. do you um do what 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 would you say are the top symptoms that you would if if it's truly just an empirical sort of diagnosis um, based on clinical symptoms and. Um, just in terms of how the patient presents, what what would be your top symptoms that you're looking for? Well, of course, the obvious is you know a person has gas, um, alternating constipation, diarrhea, kind of like obviously you know you're you're almost your typical um, IBS sort of patient that you would also look for SIBO in. But I again I would start out with the basic, you know, working with their diet, um, changing, you know, doing the probiotics. And seeing that they're already starting to get improvement with that, and then advancing the treatment as we as we see that that's been effective. Of course, the brain fog, um, oftentimes in skin situations, um, you know, I, probably one of the biggest symptoms would be the brain fog. That that seems to be mm. those those different you know metabolites. It, it, it Trust that there was seventy metabolites. If you look at the organic acid test, they have nine different metabolites. You know, mm. they have the uh, 
arabinose and the um, you know the different sugars. Mm. Mm. Um, the list of them here. There's something like yeah nine this is, different. This is through an organic acids test now. Yeah, yeah. yeah mm. They test you know they test those uh, uh, metabolites and mm -hmm. um, they're specifically related to the yeast. Mm. Yeah, so that's another good way um, to uh, to potentially help to diagnose candida. And another, just a comment I want to make on um, candida antibodies, because I know a lot of practitioners here in Australia use candida antibodies. So it, it's my understanding that unless candida has actually breached the digest or the you know the mucosal barrier, you the antibodies will be negative because it's not like it's come into contact direct contact with our defense system. So. Yeah. Um, so if you have a, a patient that tests negative for candida antibodies, it doesn't necessarily mean they don't have an overgrowth. It just means that potentially that organism hasn't yet uh, breached the, the gut wall. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. And again, Orion Trust, would, he clearly warned against the antibody test. Uh, I don't know if they've gotten uh, to be more, maybe more... Um, you know, effective or more uh, able to detect other antibodies. Uh, but he clearly has said that they he did not find them to be to be able to rule out candida. And then, of course, remember the term, the master con artist. Mm. You know, you mm. can trick the body into releasing useless antibodies so that you don't see the proper antibodies against it. Mm. Well, and also, like, just just to kind of also add to your list of um, kind of weird symptoms, you know, I think we've all seen that as practitioners. And as you just mentioned, that miraculously, they just sort of disappear, you know, and I could add a whole host of lists to uh, or symptoms to that and from eye pain to weird, like, I think joint pain actually is a big one. Um, well, you yeah, know. fibromyalgia. Yeah, because that that's the tartaric acid connection. That was that was the tartaric acid, if you recall, is the mm. Um, waste product when um, when yeast are if in the winemaking process mm. when yeast are fermented and it's not theoretically found in humans at all. So when you start to see tartaric acid in the urine, it means that you have these higher levels of um, this this waste product from yeast uh, breakdown and that causes muscle pain. Mm. That's the main, main mm -hmm. side effect. So that's the association with sort of the fibromyalgia picture. Mm -hmm. Right, which is why we give malic acid, right? There was yeah. some, some some connection of how that sort of uh, mitigates some of that of some of the tartaric acid. Can't remember the mechanism right this moment, but no, somehow, it. yeah, <laughs> way back in there somewhere. It's in there. It's in my Rolodex of <laughs> memories. <laughs> um, but you know, you brought up a really interesting point because I also um, wanted to get your take on. Saccharomyces boulardii, which is, of course, a beneficial yeast, not related necessarily to candida. But what I see in my practice is when people really have a big yeast problem, they can't tolerate it necessarily. Not in every patient, but some patients um, will get symptoms. And I'm not sure if that's because of a yeast sort of allergy or if it's, which is kind of odd because it would be specific to, I assume it would be a specific to a particular species. But like, for example, when we do food allergy testing, IgG4 testing, very often brewer's yeast and baker's yeast come up and brewer's yeast mm -hmm. is Saccharomyces boulardii or is a type of Saccharomyces. So I think a lot of people are actually sensitive to yeast as well. So they get reactions when they take um, beneficial yeast, even kombucha, right? So kombucha yeah. um, has more of beneficial yeasts and not as many beneficial bacteria or probiotics. And I can, I mean, my SIBO patients and SIBO patients cannot tolerate kombucha. Is, yeah. Do you see the same? I do, absolutely. I'm, I'm personally not a fan for that. <laughs> <laughs> just but, because of that, because it's sugar and black tea. Yeah, and not just sugar and black tea, but the fact that I don't, I don't think that we're. It's. I think that the, one of the bigger issues has to do with the, the of course, obviously the array. There's so much, uh, you know, discussion and uh, disagreement over which bacteria should be where in the body and how many they should be, and you know, there's there's a lot of question about that, and so I think. When you're introducing, you know, an array of yeast or bacteria that you really don't know much about, 
in a sort of a generic way, I just don't have any confidence that it's of, of significant use of any use. Mm. Well, I mean, they're just in terms of Saccharomyces boulardii, the biocodex strain certainly has a lot of uh, great research behind it and, oh. and being sort of antifungal, but you know, and, and it's used for yeast treatments no, in many patients. No, I use Saccharomyces. Mm. I do use mm. Saccharomyces. Mm. And I often will use Saccharomyces in a person who is very um, hyper, hypersensitive. And I don't think they can handle the nystatin to begin with. Mm. And I was sad. And I have had a, a very interesting case of a, of a woman who came to see me. I think that maybe you had gone by this time, but she had, um, and this is a, a second person I, I saw like this, who had um, a, her labia was about three times the size of normal with this sort of, in, you know, chronic low grade folliculitis that I see it as both staph and fungal, and that's where you see a real cohabitation there. And, um, she also had, you know, fungus in her ears and some other skin issues, some fatigue. She, she had a pretty decent di diet, so she was a fairly functional person. So after a, a bit, after we used some, some probiotic, we decided to put her on some nystatin. She broke out in a rash all over her entire body, and we were not able to actually ever get that completely under control. She had to actually use some steroids for that to, to get that under control. So once we were able to get that under control, we, would, we started her out on Saccharomyces boulardii, and she, the only amount she could take before she would break out to the extent, she would have small skin breakouts with opening the capsule and doing tiny amounts of Saccharomyces mm. She was able to, over a, probably a year period of time, increase that amount, um, gradually until she, was, she would, got that up to a capsule twice a day. And then we mm. eventually started her on the statin after that. And mm. even when she, went, when she was able to take the sacral B twice a day without any, you know, breakout. Once she started on the nystatin, at tiny, tiny, tiny doses, the kind that Trust would say well, you fit on the head of a toothpick, right? She would begin to break. Swear, mm. swear, swear. Mm. That's how we start our, our patients that were chemically sensitive. The amount that fit on the head of a toothpick. That's all they could handle. Mm. And and she be, would break out tiny amounts. Was able to control that. She's now. This is probably four years later. She's now taking um, a thousand um, um, in a million units twice a day. Wow. Okay. That took mm. a long time. Mm. And so, of course, the baby is under control. Her ears are better. Um, but all the ears, you know, are very hard to, to resolve just by treating. It's a different kind of, it's a different kind of organism. Mm. And once you treat the, the body, you know, those sort of external things will settle mm. down. Is but, it both um, of her ears or is it just one ear? That was both, in her particular case, it was both ears. Oftentimes it's just mm. one ear. I was reading this interesting article of some, uh, somebody who had a chronic ear infection and um, using the, the earwax from the healthy ear and just put it into the affected ear. We cleared that up. That's very interesting. It's cool, huh? Like, uh, I mean, I'm going to try it on my next patient with that problem. Um, that is just normal flora in one ear and, uh, you know, not healthy flora in the other. So just a little yeah. thing. But moving on yeah. to uh, treatment. So, you know, one of the things I want to say to the listeners is we are talking about candida in general because, you know, it is one elementary canal right so and so many different things contribute to uh candida coming uh, to the forefront as dr beeson mentioned only tiny amounts of change need to happen in the host for that to occur and certainly with with so much um assault on our microbiome it, like it's truly unprecedented you know we've never seen this in the history of humanity the species loss and the species diversification loss um, is all probably contributing to why it's so widespread. But, and, and, and proton pump inhibitors, let's not forget that, a huge contributing factor to candida overgrowth. So we're sort of talking about candida in general terms because I do think it applies um, to CIFO very much so because the treatment works, whether it's in the small or the large intestine. So, but moving on to treatment... What are your, so you, you talked about nystatin. Do you have any other, do you do, use hydrochloric acid? Do you do, I mean, obviously case dependent, but do you have sort of a, a, a protocol that works really well for your patients? Yeah, I'm pretty much wedded to the 
um, you know, an excellent probiotic, and and I, you know, I've been using the one particular one for many, many years. And I know there's lots out there. I just haven't found one that I I feel as as consistently active and as effective as the one I use. And then, which one do you use? You're, you're allowed to mention products on oh, my I show. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I use the HLC, um, and oh, that's human lactic. That... Com- that's human lactic commensals from Pharmax, mm-hmm. right? Do you remember Pharma what Pharma. strains are in there? Like uh, the... that's Lactobacillus acidophilus um, and Bifida. Um, it's two the Lactobacillus acidophilus type, and then two mm. Bifida. Mm. And then he has some FOS in the the one. He doesn't have the FOS in the HLC intensive. Mm. Um, and then the uh, there's a lot of times I'll use the HLC antibiotic care as well. That's got a hundred billion units mm. um, without FOS as well. And I, I have just been amazed more and more lately about the I, I, I feel like you can't get enough of probiotics in. And I do get I mean, mm. I can tell you over and over again, everybody at my clinic will tell you the kind of results we get from that. It's just amazing. Mm. For people just just that in the diet, it can be really dramatic for patients so so then i'm really careful in adding a nystatin and one of the reasons i I tend to use nystatin is it's very effective it's very safe and i like the fact that it doesn't get absorbed into the bloodstream it works in the gut and that's the thing that i think not only makes it safe it makes it more effective and ultimately it's actually less expensive than all the other natural things we're going to use because you don't, you know, Sacro B, which I love, it's not quite, you have to use a lot of it to have the same um, impact as Nystatin. And that's going to cost a lot more money for patients. And then also, um, you know, you can use the pure powder or you can have the pure powder compounded. Uh, and then, you know, the endosylic acid and the, um, the you know, the, um, what do you call it, caprylic acid. I, I've used those over the years, uh, tenalbit, tenalbitanic mm-hmm. acid, I think those work well as well. Um, and, you know, because I can prescribe an statin, uh, I think I can get higher concentrations of, of that that it's really effective. And, you know, when I first started treating, I used nystatin maybe six, eight months. And then when uh, Dr. Trust told me, probably in around 2002, and I was speaking with him, and he said, you will not get eradication of candida unless you treat uh, a minimum of four a million units a day. For a minimum of two years. Wow. And so, and a minimum. And so that's and that's why he says if you don't do that, the symptoms will come back. And so I tell people what I say to people is probably going to be a two-year treatment. We start them out in five hundred thousand twice a day. After you know, to, so their reaction is 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 well, actually five hundred a day, um, five hundred thousand a day for a couple of weeks, and then twice a day, depending on the person, maybe a little slower. And then after a couple of months, you know, a million once a day and five hundred thousand for a couple of weeks to a month and then go to a million twice a day and then a million and two million, you know, so three million a day and then two million is their maintenance dose. And what I tell people is I want to see you symptom free for six months before we stop. Mm. And they're That's on, they're on an anti candida diet or a SIBO diet or something for the yes, whole time. Exactly. Exactly. Which is not, okay. to me, that's not any big deal. I mean, the SIBO mm. diet is, obviously, the SIBO diet is a lot harder. But to me, an anti-candida is just a really simple, lots of fiber, mm-hmm. avoid wet circle. I, you know, that mm. whole thing, story and trust us. You don't have to avoid vinegar. You don't have to avoid tamar. You don't have to avoid mushrooms. Those are a whole different strains. You're yeah. just avoiding the white sugar, white flour, the things that are going to make it grow. That's all you're going to do. You know? So, so it's real, real y- food. Yeah, so um, that's really different than uh, what a lot of, I think, naturopathic practitioners are doing here. Right? Well, of course, we can't prescribe Nystatin here, or Nilstat, yeah. as it's known here in Australia. Um, but what I wanted to ask before I uh, move on to what my antifungals are, since I can't prescribe Nystatin, although I do refer for a prescription, but now I'm thinking... Jesus, I got to go way up, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I start with 500,000. When, when, when I ask people to get a script, I do ask them to just get 500,000. I use twice a day um, or units rather um, twice a day. But my question was, you know, what did Dr. Truss say is the mechanism then if nystatin is not absorbed and yet you're getting systemic improvements from this medication? Because you're treating it at the source where you have the colonies, right? And as, you, as you're as you able to eradicate those colonies, 
then you're, you're not going to have the permeability, you're not going to have the, um, you know, endotoxins or the metabolites that are causing the systemic effect. Mm. So, because, because I, you know, you've seen yourself as doing the um, fluconazoles, um, you know, the diflucan, the ketoconazole, uh, those, I have never, ever seen, you know, I've used those a little bit over the years, and I've had to use those sometimes, uh, you know, sporadically while we're using my statin um, to treat, like, say, maybe a sinusitis or a vaginitis, but it won't treat the cause. And so even though it may help symptomatically, the symptoms are going to come back unless you treat the core, which is the gut. Mm-hmm. And so that's where nystatin is effective because it's staying in the gut and that's where it's working. You know, and it's not like uh, the uh, uh, antibiotic is going to just immediately wipe it out. I sort of th- see of it as that it, it, it reduces the, the capability of those colonies to, um, it, to function. It, makes, it, re- it reduces the size of them. It gradually kills off the yeast over time as you're regrowing the healthy bacteria. It's kind of like if, you know, in the backyard, if you have a lot of weeds growing, you go poison them. And if you don't regrow the grass, you're not going to um, be successful in, you know, having a perfect lawn. So you can poison all you want, but you have to regrow the healthy flora. And that's why the nystatin will, you know, again, over time, reduce colonization, help eradicate the, or maybe it doesn't even completely eradicate it, but reduce the colonization enough and probably some of the hi-fi, you know, invasion, but, but it's the regrowth of the healthy bacteria. Again, mm. they're, they're more of a s- symptom of the dysbiosis, right? That you're overriding the healthy bacteria with these or other organisms. And so now you are able to reduce those down to a more manageable, but it has to be done over a long period of time to really reestablish the normal microbiome. So do you use uh, biofilm along with nystatin and did, did Dr. Truss use that? Because I'm wondering if not. you could, if you could cut down on your timing um, or the time frame rather of treatment, if, if a biofilm disruptor, you know, that's sort of like a, a whole new field. And Dr. Anderson yeah. actually gave a really interesting lecture at the, I can't even remember it. I think it was at the AANP. Uh, yes. But, uh, you know, so about the different levels of biofilm disruption and that much of what we think is useful, like N-acetylcysteine and maybe some enzymes, is like maybe a poke in the eye for <laughs> these colonies, yeah, you know. I agree, I agree. They, they I agree. don't really respond that well. So we might, we might you know, have this feel-good factor that we've, in, that we've used a biofilm disruptor with NAC when actually it isn't, it's somewhat useful, but certainly not with these deep-seated colonies that, um, you know, need absolute penetration for them to really kind of start to break up. Well, I mean, I, I guess I, I haven't, I really feel like we get great results. And I think maybe the biggest problem with those results has to do with that, the realization that we're not looking at uh, the time that it's going to take for, you know, the body, the, co- the colon to be, again, if you think of candida as more of a dysbiosis, and it's not about just getting rid of candida, but it's about restoring the flora throughout the colon, it's going to take time to do that. You are regrowing an entire garden or a rainforest, right? So I feel like that's maybe the bigger factor is that recognizing that it's, it's, a, it's a process that, um, is not going to happen overnight, and I and I think in recognizing that and in keeping in mind his sort of two-year landmark, and seeing people get better and better and better, for the most part, I see that you know the majority of people and those people who don't, that's when we start looking at like SIBO, or you know I think then you start looking at the biofilms and look at you know getting fancier with that. But I just haven't seen that we needed to do that in general. Which is you know. Uh, definitely proof that you are, I mean, you're obviously getting great results. It's, and that's why I wanted you uh, to be on the show, because I think, I mean, for me, it's obviously now I, I look for SIBO. And one of the things that I like about SIBO treatment is that it, with our herbal combinations, we also address candida, you know, but I am seeing 
um, a whole new level of um, very chronic illness that when you start to specialize, uh, you you start to see patients yeah. like that. And I think, um, you know, the incorporation of something like Nystatin or Nilstat, just par for the course for a long time, might really help to pull these patients around. Like I had a conversation with Donna Beck about salicylate sensitivity and candida really contributing to that phenomenon. And, mm. you know, I think that, I mean, if we start to be more aware that it, it takes a really long time rather than just our six week normal course of antimicrobials to get rid of something that's really embedded and ingrained in, in the mucosal membrane, that I think that's really helpful. So I, what I usually use as a combination treatment, if somebody's hydrogen dominant, for example, in particular, would be um, a product that contains philodendron or, or berberine and uh -huh. three different types of essential oil. And that definitely packs a punch also for candida. Uh -huh. um, and then my next favorite for candida alone is a New Zealand herb um, called horopito which is known mm. as uh, Colorex. And it's a really spicy herb. Oh, I know Colorex. Yeah. I remember I used to use that way back too. Yeah. I remember you, yeah. Yeah, it's sure. really helpful. It's really good. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a small little gel cap, so it's nice, to, it's easy to take. If I could prescribe Nystatin, to be honest, that's what I would do as well. But you mm -hmm. become creative, of course, as a practitioner. And yeah. just another thought on Saccharomyces, um, is that one of the real benefits to Saccharomyces as a uh, fertilizer for the soil, if we kind of keep the analogy of the regrowing the rainforest, is that it increases the adherence of beneficial bacteria by about 60% or so. So it's a really good ad adjunct to treatments if people are not sensitive to uh, yeast as discussed. So uh, mm -hmm. I do like that and other sort of gut builders. Um, but I do want to get people on, you know, we, Dr. Um, Horlack was on, was at the SIBO summit uh, here in Australia. And he really was, is sort of an expert. And I know that you are, um, you know, also are very familiar with some of these concepts, but that we can't really out supplement or we can't really supplement with probiotics and expect all of the species to return. Sometimes the damage is yeah. so big yeah. um, or extensive, we've lost species, that in yeah. order to sort of coax them back, it's more a prebiotic issue, which is um, either, you know, partially hydro hydrolyzed guar gum or um, uh, lactulose even, or um, GOS, which is galacto-oligosaccharide, that's the bimuno product from England, really helpful mm -hmm. in regrowing bifidobacterium. Uh, but it, it's always a timing issue. You know, I certainly don't start mm -hmm. off with that with my with treatment. Right. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. just wondered if you and obviously, you know, healthy diet, a whole food diet with lentils and um, uh, whole grain, like whole grains in their whole form, not not whole grain bread, but like mm -hmm. healthy fibers are so right. essential to regrowing that rainforest. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And that's why I think that thinking about this over time, which is hard when people are sick and they're not feeling well and they're reacting to all those foods, it's challenging a lot of the time to, you know, have that the patience to, um, you know, work with a, a simple diet and a good probiotic and the nice diet and say, you know, you're getting, you, you're better in these three months than you've been, you know, the prior three months and, <clears throat> and three more months you'll be better. It's kind of like weight loss, you know. It's, a, it's a, why people want to do diets. You know, it's very, very hard for people to, to recognize that you, you, the entire microbiome has to be rebuilt, and that isn't going to happen, um, you know, within six weeks or even in six months. It just it's going to take a long time to do it, and it's it's pretty amazing to see that that ha happen over time. Mm. Um, but it is hard to to help people understand that, or you know. Um, to, uh, feel confident in that. Yeah, it is. And, and I think because you've done this for so long, you, like it's always easier to convince somebody when you've seen it so many times before, you know, mm -hmm. so for sure. Do you have any other favorite gut healing uh, products or nutrients in conjunction with like candida treatment? Do you find that you always, 
you know, give, I don't know, vitamin A or zinc or anything else for mucosal integrity? Um, you know, I do, I give, I don't always give vitamin A, but I would give it if I felt like there, when I see that there are other signs of vitamin A deficiency, like, you know, a person isn't converting a beta carotene appropriately, so if they have the zoatic, you know, folliculitis on their, you know, their uh, arms, um, sometimes with hypothyroidism, you'll see that. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty simple in a lot of ways because I feel like, you know, sustainability for taking substances is, is challenging for people, you know, cost-wise and, um, you know, staying with the, you know, uh, a, a product or a program is challenging. So I try and, uh, as you know, do things on a really an individual basis and limit the, you know, the kinds of things that I have people go home with. And oftentimes, you know, there are other issues that people are dealing with. And so by the time you, you know, treat just a simple candida and then you treat, you know, what other, you know, maybe uh, emotional issues or other skin issues, that there, there's already so many things we would take. So I guess, you know, and I, I, I struggle with, you know, like the whole glutamine issue, like when are we going to do that? You know, when in the mm. process of, of intestinal repairability, does that does that feel appropriate? You know, um, I I know I think I, I'm also you know a big fan during this whole process of supporting the liver because and I think it depends on that was one of the other things the you know the issues with with the metabolites and the die off is uh, what other medications is a person taking or what is their stress level um, because you know you and depending on what their um, you know, SNPs are and their detoxification pathways, mm. that that's a, a factor in a person being able to, you know, respond or, or not have uh, reactions to the yeast die off. So then we, I might actually go more in the direction of, of liver detoxification and uh, making sure that their liver is able to process appropriately by using, you know, some kind of liver detox and support product or having them do clonics uh, on some sort of a regular basis or really a fan of just doing detox intermittently throughout the um, the uh, candida treatment so maybe twice in a year just to really enhance the um, liver's ability to process that waste because as you well know if the liver isn't able to you know uh, dispose of those metabolites it's going to store it in the connective tissue and you know, we 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 um, circulate those whenever the burden on the liver is down. So, I think I probably focus a little bit more on um, supporting the liver's ability to get rid of those toxins as they're being uh, killed off. Mm. Mm. And certainly at the Yellowstone Naturopathic Clinic in Billings, Montana, you do have a sort of a spa slash um, facility, right? Like you do. Um, do you still do colonics there? And, and, yep, we yeah. have colonics. Yep, and we have our yeah. sauna cold print, so we do a lot of. Um, I really do recommend doing during the yeast treatment that people do mm -hmm. uh, the you know a lot of skin detoxification. So it's because you know as we know the skin is a organ of elimination. So you know enhancing that way of, of people just feel better when they're you know doing the yeast treatment if they're moving stuff through when they're detoxing they're moving through through their skin you know through their colon through their lungs, through their uh, urinary tract. Um, so, so do you do sauna for the skin or what sauna do you... Sauna cold plunge. Yep, sauna uh, cold plunge. So right, do that right, right, right. Yeah, I'm starting to... Home. Yeah, I'm starting to recommend a lot more hydrotherapy. You know, that'll be another episode, I, I, I think. But um, so this has been fantastic. So how, how can people um, find you? And you have a big team around you, right? You have a lot of mm -hmm. different, uh, doctors that are working with you. You're yes. in, in, uh, beautiful Billings, Montana. So mm -hmm. how do people find you when, if they're listening from America and they want to, they want to come and see you or one of your associates and you also do start, um, you have a breath tracker there, right? So you're testing for SIBO. Yes. We have, yeah. yeah. We call it the Yellowstone SIBO center now. Oh my God. Congrats. <laughs> You're legit. You. Yeah, <laughs> That's yeah. great. Dr. Krieger is, is the head of that and yeah. uh, Jennifer Krieger. And so we are at um, YNCNaturally.com. Uh, great. www.YNCNaturally.com. Naturally. 
Right. Well, yeah. people um, can just come to uh, the website, sibotest.com, and, and have the uh, all of your links to your website and how they can find you. Dr. Beeson, this has been fabulous. It's always such a wonderful pleasure to talk to you. I hope you um, come back on the program because I know there's just like we just touched the tip of the iceberg and you have other topics that could really help a lot of our listeners. So, Dr. Beeson, before you go, before we go, do you have any last minute clinical pearls for us? Well, I don't know if this is exactly a clinical pearl, but it's something that I found, found really of interest. It's, it's always intriguing to me. The, it is continuing to be intriguing to me how the celiac um, disease is, has been on the rise. And so I, always, I felt like it had to have something to do with antibiotic use. It was just something about that that just kept coming up for me, you know, and, and possibly something about candida. So there is this article actually stems from 2003 in Lancet. The question is, is candida albicans a trigger in the onset of celiac disease? And it says that, you know, it's cel- celiac is... is cell mediated autoimmune disease of the small intestine. Um, we postulate that candida is a trigger in the onset of celiac. It is a virulence factor of candida albicans hypho wall protein, and then they mention it's HWP1, contains amino acid sequences that are identical or highly homologous to the known celiac disease related alpha gliadin and gamma gliadin C cell epitopes. Wow. So the HWP1 mm. is a trans glutamate substrate. Mm is used by candida to adhere to the intestinal epithelium. Furthermore, tissue to transglutaminase and endomysium components could become covalently linked to the yeast. Subsequently, candida might function as an adjuvant that stimulates antibody formation against HWP1 and gluten and formation of an autoreactive antibody against tissue to transglutaminase and endomycelium. Is that fascinating? That is really interesting. And I, you know, this is, I've said it in previous podcasts, but I do think that on many levels, we're just starting to sort of peek over the fence of what the conversation is that's, that's being had by the microbiome, the microbiome, the virome, the whole kit and caboodle, you know, so it's mm, great. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Beeson. And I really hope that we uh, have you on the show again soon, because it's a bit of a pleasure. I will look forward. (laughs) All right. You take care. Thanks again. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to the SIBO Doctor podcast. We hope you found the information in this episode useful in the treatment of your SIBO patients. Head over to our sponsor, SIBOTest.com, an online testing service for your patients and home of the Practitioner Education Portal. Tune in again for another episode of the SIBO Doctor Podcast. Thanks again for listening.